Uh, yeah, so my name is Sergey Koposov. I'm from University of Edinburgh. And today I'll be talking about the streams as probes of uh, dark matter distribution uh, and gravitational potential of the Milky Way. So that's something uh, quite different to what we've been talking uh, mostly this week. But I would argue that uh, that's, there are still uh, close connections because this is a field basically of near field cosmology. We try to answer questions about the galaxy assembly and uh, galaxy formation using results of population in the Milky Way in nearby galaxies. So uh, the, uh, the, the main topic for today for me is are the stellar streams. And again, since this has been uh, talked much about before, I'll start with a bit of introduction what stellar streams are. And then uh, uh, before going to uh, talk about some more recent results about stellar streams, I'll also uh, talk a little bit about kind of more technical aspects, how we actually go from uh, the existing observations to actual uh, how we extract information from stellar streams and how and then how we use that information to do inference from stellar streams for example how we can use that information to constrain the uh, dark matter distribution in the milky way and then later i'll talk about uh, some of the recent results we got from the combination of the gaia data and the s5 uh, survey so first, what are the stellar streams? Basically, stellar streams are just what you naturally get if you disrupt a dwarf galaxy or star cluster in the gravitational potential. Basically, the object uh, start to lose stars from the two Lagrange points, and those particles escape. And since they have a similar energy and momentum, they basically mostly follow the orbit of the original dwarf galaxy or st star cluster. So basically, we have this kind of one-dimensional thin tube of stars that basically wraps around the galaxy. And uh, the key thing here is that uh, the, the, the streams that you expect should be more or less smooth. And also the, uh, the velocity dispersion in the structure should be basically similar to the velocity dispersion of the original object. So therefore, if you're disrupting star cluster with the dispersion of one kilometer per second, these streams will also be uh, very dynamically cold. And so that means that they're actually extremely uh, sensitive uh, uh, as we're going to later see, extremely sensitive to uh, perturbations. So uh, this is how they formed. Uh, so in the past 20 years, we've been finding a large number of these stellar streams around the Milky Way. This is some of the images of the basically showing stellar densities in large patches of the sky from various surveys, showing that we do detect a large number of these linear features caused by stellar streams. Uh, the key thing is that they extremely low surface brightness. So we're talking about surface brightnesses of down to 34th magnitude per square second. And very often we're dealing with uh, I know, having say one star per square degree kind of densities, especially if we're limited uh, by what's available say to Gaia. So it's extremely low surface brightness. Uh, and so initially the discoveries were made using photometric surveys, but in the last few years with the arrival of Gaia, it also became possible to use the Gaia proper motion to very efficiently find some of the streams because basically you can, uh, you know that all the stars should be moving in the same direction. So Gaia proper motion help you to find, find the stream more effectively. And so basically by now uh, we are in a state where uh, there is a num large number of uh, claimed stellar streams, uh, about a hundred. This is a plot from a recent paper by Matteo showing the tracks of all those streams. Uh, from the literature, I know the, I, the reason I say claimed is because not all of these streams have been spectroscopically confirmed, but I think probably a large fraction of those are indeed, uh, are indeed real. And so the question is now, okay, we have those streams, uh, I know, large number of these streams, what we actually can do with this and why this is actually interesting. Uh, and the main thing here is uh, basically the streams are uh, great tracers of the gravitational potential. And because basically, as I was saying, they, when you form a stream, basically more or less follows an orbit. So therefore, if you have positions and velocities of stars along this orbit, you basically can directly constrain the acceleration because you basically measure how the velocities are changing. So, and that's quite different to say, just regular observations of stars in the Milky Way stellar halo, because there, you, if you know one star position velocity, another star position velocity, they're on different orbits. So they don't tell you anything about the potential unless you assume some kind of distribution function. So here, but here you basically directly measure accelerations. Furthermore, I know those streams are covering large volumes of, uh, large volume in the, inside the galaxy. So some are close to this galactic center, some are far away. So you really kind of hope uh, to, uh, to, to be able to, to map the potential uh, with, uh, with the stellar streams. 
And again, also it's important because uh, it's important that the streams are thin. So therefore you should be able to get kind of accurate constraints on the say the track and velocities in the structure. So you hope to be able to get uh, quite accurate constraints on the potential. And so basically the idea was uh, for, for a long time is that basically we would be able to get some constraint from one stream uh, and then you should be able to combine information from many streams and basically hopefully to get really accurate description of the galactic potential. So here is just a plot showing the kind of the uh, analysis of simulation showing what we might expect uh, on, in terms of accuracy of determining the flattening of the dark matter halo in the Milky Way. And so with maybe one stream, you get you know, accuracy of 0.1, but as you get more and more streams and you can uh, kind of break some of the generalities on the Milky Way potential, you can get really accurate constraints on the potential. But in fact, in the reality turns out to be uh, quite a bit more complicated uh, than that, uh, unfortunately or unfortunately. Uh, so another key thing why streams are, are quite exciting is that they are actually great trace, uh, great probes of the uh, perturbation to the galactic potential. And as I was telling you, because the streams are extremely dynamically cold, so they have velocity dispersion of kilometers per second, even a tiny perturbation will leave a trace in the stream. And so basically, uh, if you have a stream like that, and then you have a a flyby of a dark matter halo of maybe a mass of 10 to the seven or 10 to the eight, or maybe even 10 to the five, what you expect is basically this dark matter halo, when it flies by, it perturbs the stream, creates the first sort of a wiggle. And then you know, over time, this wiggle kind of disperses. And what you have is you have some stars outside of the stream, but also then you have this kind of gap or the kind of decrease in density of the stream. And this is really key prediction that I know, if lambda CDM is right and there are a lot of these subhalos around, we should expect streams to show the signs of perturbations. And this was really uh, one of the kind of know, key, key things that we're looking for uh, uh, analyzing these streams in, in the Milky Way. So uh, what do we see currently with existing data? Uh, so yeah, and especially in the last few years with the arrival of Gaia, we've been able to uh, probe the streams in quite a lot of detail. And so if we look at this stream in particular, this is GD1, one of the most uh, closest to our streams. And if you look here, you can see that this stream definitely doesn't look smooth and like it's kind of single straight, a single orbit. Instead, you definitely see a lot of structure. Sometimes some, in some areas, the stream is broader. You see gaps in the streams. You see some material outside the stream. Uh, in case of some other streams, like here, so this was the original discovered stream, but then it turns out that there is a almost essentially a parallel stream. So there is definitely a lot of structure in the streams. The question is, is this all caused by dark matter? Uh, uh, I know the answer is uh, we don't know because in fact there are unfortunately several other reasons that can produce similar kind of uh, substructures or, or, or at least not that is similar but it can produce substructures in streams and so one of, one of them is for example is that if you accrete a, a global cluster and it creates a stream usually the global cluster comes together with a dwarf galaxy that was parent to that global cluster. So therefore, when the global cluster is going to form that stream, you're going to have this dark matter halo from the dwarf galaxy kind of wandering around. And that, uh, that dark matter halo can then easily perturb the stream and produce some of the structures like this. So produce basically a stream that, which doesn't look like a nice kind of Gaussian tube. Also, there are other uh, satellites in the Milky Way. There are like Sagittarius dwarf galaxy uh, and other classical dwarf galaxies. And that also can lead to streams that are you know, messed up in uh, all sorts of ways. Plus there is a galactic bar uh, and uh, you know, giant molecular clouds and all that can produce uh, you know, different substructures. So one of the questions really would like to answer is to be able to understand, uh, to understand when, which of these perturbations we observe are caused by dark matter subhalos and which are not. And so for that, really, what we need to do is we need to be able to carefully extract information, measure all the streams, and uh, then to basically uh, try to construct models and then to, uh, to be able to separate these different perturbation mechanisms and also use the streams to constrain the potential. And so in the next uh, small section, I'm going to talk about how do we actually measure streams and then uh, how do we model and how we do inference with streams. So uh, let me actually first talk about how we model streams. So first, uh, let me just say that in general, if we try to 
kind of model streams, the ideal in the ideal world would like to have uh, some like full, full forward model of the stream where we'd be able to favor parameters of the galactic potential, evaluate the likelihood function. That's like an ideal world. But uh, for example, for the streams, we, there is no analytical model here. So the best we can do is we can run simulations. So we can take some potential, uh, put the progenitor at some point in phase space, run it for some time, and it will produce simulation like this. And obviously, the more particle you want, the longer it will take. Usually, this is not done with full and body, but some kind of approximation. Uh, but you know, that's what you get. That's how we can uh, model the streams. OK, so now the question is, so this is the model. Uh, how do you compare it to the data? So this is the model. Uh, this is an example of the data. And you can clearly see there are like few issues here. So in this data, for example, there is no clear uh, we don't clearly know which star is necessarily a member, which is not, because I know we don't have spectroscopy for each of those stars. Furthermore, I know it's not like this stream here can be described by a single kind of parametric model, some kind of, I don't know, I know just a kind of, uh, parabola here or something, or constant width. So it really needs some kind of flexible model, but it's also be able to uh, take into account, say, the, the contamination and, and basically some sort of mixture model. So basically, that's what we, uh, uh, we kind of came up uh, with a few years ago, uh, how to kind of fit, fit, with, fit with those streams using the uh, non-parametric uh, uh, spline-based models. So the idea is I know, somewhat simple. Basically, imagine this is your stream. And what we do is basically we parameterize the stream through a series of uh, cubic splines, where we basically parameterize the, uh, the track of the, of the stream as a cubic spline, we parameterize the width of the stream as a cubic spline, we parameterize the, surface, the logarithm of surface brightness as a cubic spline, and basically, and, and, but the cross section is Gaussian. Uh, and so uh, through this model, uh, th this, this, can, this model can be say, you can evaluate the likelihood of any kind of sparse data set. So if you have a set of stars, like on the previous slide, you should be able to evaluate the likelihood of each star, or even if you have like incomplete footprint. Uh, also, this model can be combined together with some model for the fore foreground. So uh, you can deal with contamination without having to know for sure whether a given star is a member or not. Uh, also, this kind of model can easily be applied to measurement of say proper motions and radio velocity signals as well. And basically, uh, uh, so uh, yes, yeah, so, so so this is a, a quite powerful and flexible model, and you can adjust the flexibility of this model by basically changing the number of uh, knots in your spline. Uh, and in total, uh, for you know, cases that I'm talking about, we're dealing with models potentially many tens or hundreds of parameters. Usually, that would be difficult to do with standard MCMC techniques. So what we usually do is, so we implement these models in the stand programming language, which is a uh, kind of probabilistic programming language that also has a Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. And uh, so that can deal with, with this kind of problems very well. And as a result of this uh, application of this kind of modeling to, uh, to the stream, basically we get uh, some kind of data vector. So basically measurements of the spline, uh, the, at the values of the spline at the knots with the associated error bar and maybe covariance matrix. And that we can then compare to the actual, uh, to what we see in the model. So basically we kind of, we go from the model uh, to the observable space and compute the corresponding values as spline knots and then compare those to the data vector. So that gives us the full likelihood. And that's how we can extract uh, information from streams and then actually do inference with the streams. Okay, so that's how uh, the kind of the techniques work and uh, at least the, what we've been using in our work. And so now let me switch to the actual examples of this work. And this work has been ba based, uh, the work I'm going to talk about will be based mostly on this uh, survey that I've been involved in. This is the S5 survey. This is a survey led by Ting Lee in the University of Toronto, which has basically been following up uh, using the AT, this, uh, the uh, stars in the stellar streams using the preselection from Gaia. And by now we got about 100,000 stars observed. You can see the footprint here. Uh, and so we really got information on uh, more than a dozen of stellar streams. And so now let's see, uh, we're gonna look at just a couple of streams from our work. So first, uh, this is the stream uh, called Atlas or Alikauma. So uh, this is a work from uh, 
uh, from a couple of years ago, basically uh, one of the interesting discoveries from uh, this paper was that, uh, so previously it was thought that uh, there is a separate stream called Atlas here, and there is another stream called Alikauma here. And so when we actually measured the radio velocities and proper motions of the, of the stars in the streams, we basically saw that uh, the, the proper motions and radio velocities of those streams are basically directly, they directly connect. So this is in fact, uh, I don't know, just one single stream, not two separate ones. It's just this stream for some reason has this kind of uh, one degree or about one kiloparsec gap in it. So this is already uh, telling us that this particular stream has been definitely uh, strongly perturbed by something. In this particular case, uh, one of this particular perturbation it was probably from something quite massive, uh, maybe of the uh, uh, type of like uh, a classical dwarf galaxy rather than a small subhalo. Uh, but on top of this uh, big perturbation here, when we look at say our extraction of the stream property right here, so we can see say the stream width which kind of, kind of becomes much broader at this location. Also, uh, this uh, expansion in the stream width is accompanied by this kind of uh, know, drastic change in stream track, a shift by about 0.2 degrees. This is also likely associated with some kind of um, smaller perturbation. I know at this point in time, we still do not know what is the exact cause of those perturbations. We still need kind of more data and more modeling uh, effort to, to, uh, to, to uh, to, to be properly associate uh, this, this, uh, uh, these perturbations to, to uh, specific perturbers. So this is just one case, uh, one stellar stream from our work. So now the, the, fi the final few minutes are gonna talk about the, uh, the paper that we published this year is about the uh, one particular stream called Orphan Shinab. So this is a stream that was found quite a while ago. And uh, when we looked at this stream if, uh, four years ago, what we saw with the, uh, from Gaia data is the stream appeared kind of twisted uh, and basically doesn't uh, align with the plane that goes through the galactic center. Uh, and uh, so something was uh, kind of appeared a little bit off with the stream. And when we started to look a bit further, we looked at the motion of stars in the stream. And so this is the, um, uh, the map so here it points ID with those stars showing the distribution of stars on the sky in degrees here, 200 degrees, 10 degrees. And what we saw is that uh, while on one part of the stream, the stars are moving along the stream, in another part of the stream, the stars are moving across the stream. And that's not what you'd expect because a stream is like, you should think of it as like a, a train on a railroad. Basically all the stars should move along the railroad, which is the, the orbit. And so the fact that they don't means that it has been perturbed by something. In this particular case, it was clear that it has been perturbed by the large Magellanic cloud. And in fact, you can uh, use this perturbation to constrain just the total mass of the clouds. In this case, we got the measurement of about 10 to 11 solar mass, which is 10% of the mass of the Milky Way. And this is quite substantial because I know this means that the kind of Milky Way and Elm Seam is not just some kind of minor merger. We expect significant perturbation to the Milky Way. So for example, we expect that the center of the Milky Way will not be static anymore. If the center of the Milky Way will actually move around the common center of mass. Also, you expect that the dark matter halo, dark matter distribution in the Milky Way will be heavily reshaped by this interaction. Here's a plot from uh, the work by Gravito Camargo showing the kind of uh, uh, the dark matter enhancement kind of created by the interaction with the OMC where one of those uh, clouds is caused by just dynamical friction because when you have an object moving through the uh, dark matter, you basically naturally create a cloud of dark matter behind you. Uh, and another, another over density is caused by kind of the shift of the Milky Way. So, and, and overall, this really also kind of messes up all this nice picture we had that we're gonna observe, measure tens of streams and give, give us really accurate constraint to the galactic potential because now we're sitting in this time dependent potential with the dark matter that's, that's constantly changing with time as well, dark matter distribution. So this was one of the reasons why we basically wanted to uh, 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 observe uh, this, this stream, the orphan Shinab stream. So we, we targeted it uh, for, uh, so we observed this for almost five years. We wanted to get more information to be able to probe uh, uh, better this interaction with, uh, with the OMC. And so, uh, so the, here is just one plot from the papers on the top. This is the spatial distribution 
of the stars in the stream. So again, this is 200 degrees on the sky. This is 10 degrees on the sky. So you can see the stream here, and you can already see it's a little bit bent here. And on the bottom, this is the, uh, the same plot, but just now with the arrows again showing the proper motions of stars, and here's LMC. And you can see this, the stars are here moving towards the LMC. So, uh, and so we basically uh, obtained a lot of data on the stream. We applied all this uh, spline-based techniques to extract basically the positions, velocities, distances, proper motions, radio velocities, the full 6D uh, phase space track of this structure using the spline-based method that I talked about. And then uh, we then tried to model this, uh, model this data uh, in, uh, in, in the Milky Way potential. So here's just the kind of summary plot showing uh, the assembly of all the data we have in our best fit model. So here's a uh, track on the sky, distance modulus, uh, proper motion, radio velocities plotted against the angle along the stream. Again, this is about 200 degrees on the sky. And in blue is the model. So the model is basically the stream produced in this potential where you have a, a Milky Way potential uh, and the LMC moving around. The LMC, Milky Way is not nailed to a uh, given point. The, uh, the Milky Way is allowed to move around the common center of mass. But in this model, we didn't allow deformation. So basically the shape of the Milky Way uh, and the shape of the LMC is fixed. Uh, but we, we have uh, our param the parameters of the Milky Way dark matter halos are free. The parameters of the LMC dark matter halo are free. And so let's see what we get from, from this model. So again, because we have so precise 6D data, we're actually able to get very accurate uh, constraints on the dark matter distribution in both Milky Way and LMC. So here, here's the uh, plot showing the uh, constraints on the cumulative mass profile inside the Milky Way. So on the x-axis, this is galactocentric distance. On the y-axis is the mass inside a given radius. And basically our stream probe this range here uh, and this is where our constraints are the most accurate, uh, well, as accurate as about 5%. Uh, and one of the total mass we get is 8 times 10 to 11, but obviously that's an extrapolation because our data is just here. So uh, on top of that, we also constrain the dark matter sh halo shape. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm not going to show the results from that, but uh, the next thing is... Uh, because our stream was perturbed by OMC, we're sensitive to uh, the OMC, not only dark matter mass, but also the OMC dark matter distribution. And the reason is because just the stream, when it approaches the, the OMC, different parts of the stream approach it at different distances. So we naturally probe how much mass there is inside different radii. And so here I show the cumulative mass profile for the OMC. Uh, one can compare it with previous measurements from the rotation curves. Uh, and uh, this is the closest approach distance uh, of the stream. And uh, one of the kind of most interesting things here is uh, not only we get the, get the mass, uh, get the mass uh, of the, uh, uh, get the mass of the OMC, but also we're able to say that the uh, OMC dark matter halo extends uh, to at least 55 kiloparsecs. So it's not truncated uh, at 55 kiloparsecs. And the reason why it's interesting is because it means that potentially at the location of the sun, we may expect to see some dark matter particles from the OMC. And it's obviously relevant uh, if for say direct detection experiments. So uh, another thing is that, so in our model, what we did is uh, we, we assumed that the dark matter halos are uh, uh, kind of fixed shape and they don't deform. However, it is possible to actually model our data using deforming models. And this is, has been done by Sophia Lillingen uh, in, in this paper. And basically, uh, so this is a, the resulting dark matter distribution in the Milky Way at some point of the interaction. And this is dark matter distribution in LMC at some point of interaction. And basically we can see that the existing data we have on the sulfur and upstream allows us to directly constrain the strength of this deformation. And this is, I think, quite exciting because I know at least, I know, at least in some uh, uh, dark matter models, maybe some fuzzy dark matter models, you may expect uh, I know, th th this kind of deformation to be somewhat, somewhat different. Uh, another thing uh, is uh, that we also constrain with existing data is the strength of dynamical friction on the OMC. So uh, wh why, why we can do that? So basically because our, we, our stream is long and it was kind of passing next to the OMC, so we're basically it's sensitive to where OMC was at different points in time. So basically, uh, sensitive to the 
traje past trajectory of LMC, and therefore we can constrain how it was slowing down due to dynamical friction. So for example, this is a plot showing the uh, kind of past trajectory of LMC based on the prior, uh, this is in galactic coordinates, red and the posterior. So we, we're sensitive to that. Yep. Uh, uh, and so uh, the, the reason why this is also interesting because dynamical friction is, again, this is something that is uh, sensitive to uh, uh, what kind of dark matter you have. Obviously, if you have, uh, say, non-particle dark matter, you don't have dynamical friction at all. Uh, but say, again, in some fuzzy dark matter models, the, the strength of dynamical friction, it can be somewhat different. Uh, okay, so now uh, let me uh, come to the conclusions here. So hopefully I convinced you that streams are powerful constraints of the uh, galactic potential, and also they are very sensitive to perturbations. It's just at the moment, uh, we do observe a large number of perturbations, but we just cannot yet associate them with this kind of specific perturbers. We hope to be able to uh, use these perturbations to constrain the, the, the uh, amount of substructure in dark matter down to a scale of about 10 to the 6, uh, maybe 10 to the 5. Uh, but that but going to 10 to 5 certainly requires uh, maybe I don't know, the next few years. Uh, and uh, also, I think the, the, this interaction of the uh, Milky Way that we see in the resulting dark matter deformation, to me, the, the kind of closest uh, object in mind, uh, cl closest uh, object come to my mind is the bullet cluster. I think, I think this is a, a kind of similar object uh, because we, we see this kind of interaction, we see the kind of dark matter uh, know, deformation. And I, I, I think there is hope that the observation of this deformation can tell us more about the nature of dark matter. Thank you. Questions for Sergey? Thank you, very nice talk. I'm curious uh, whether the streams can be used to uh, find satellites of LNC or SMC. Mm, I, I think, I think my, my, my expectation is that in most cases, it's usually easier to find the, 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 the object, the satellite itself, than the stream, because the stream are even more, generally, they have even lower surface brightness than the, the satellites. So I think, at least I don't recall ever a case of I don't know, finding a stream and finding the, the, the progenitor later. Uh, so, so, yeah, I, th I, think, I think, yeah, I think finding satellites is easier than finding streams. Thank you. More questions for Sergey? Okay, uh, yeah, just wonderful work. Um, the dozen or so streams that you showed at the beginning that you're sort of building this work on. I mean, what are the prospects for that? I mean, can you, given the Gaia data and you, have you looked over how, um, have you plumbed the depths of the Gaia data set or will there be 10 times more or what? So in terms of number of streams, I think, I think uh, so I, th I think that uh, many streams have been found in Gaia data, mostly by the Stream Finders Corporation. I think, I doubt there is many more in the existing Gaia data. But say with the next data releases, the proper motion accuracy will be significantly better. Uh, so I think there is a chance for finding more streams. Uh, I think the expectation is say with the LSST, we certainly will be able to uh, uh, go further in the galaxy and find more streams. Uh, I don't think we have a good understanding how many streams we expect in the Milky Way. Say for the number of Milky Way satellites, I don't know there is a number that's probably ballpark accurate like 400 but for streams i don't think we know because uh know, we don't quite there are no studies that really looked into account the, the incompleteness of existing searches and we don't know how many were missing that are really low surface brightness so it's a bit hard to tell how many more we'll find yeah okay other questions So, uh, Sergey, so the um, thing that I wanted to ask is about the dark matter perturbation. So, if you say you forget about all the other uh, normal perturbation sources which don't have anything to dark matter, uh, to do with dark matter, 
then uh, what is the expected number of these perturbations that you uh, could have seen? And is the number that you see in the perturbation, is it larger than what you expect or not? So that's one. The second question is related to there is a like bond and so on. Are there any uh, possibilities to get these kind of gaps? Please. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so, so regarding the number of perturbations. So first, obviously, the number of perturbations depends on the mass, right? So, uh, but like for ten to the eight, maybe you would expect like a handful across all the streams we know now. Uh, for for low mass, you expect many, and they should kind of. Average out in, in some sense. Uh, so there have been some studies that looked into uh, basic structure along the stream using kind of power spectrum, density power spectrum, and that seems kind of broadly consistent with lambda CDM. I think my personal kind of worry about those comparisons is that right now we observe too much structure and we don't understand what's the cause of it. And without understanding what is the cause of different substructures, I would be a bit reluctant to just go into power spectrum and say, uh, compare it to numerical simulations. So, uh, yeah, so, so I guess that's, that's answer to your first question. Uh, the, the second question regarding the MOND and, and the substructure and streams, to my knowledge, I don't think anything would be expected, but, but I'm not a MOND expert. Uh, So let's thank all the speakers uh, for the session again.